Hello, this is uh, Dan Shea with Veterans for Peace Forum. Again, I have, uh, like always, we have some great guests. Uh, uh, this time we're going to spend some time. As you know from the last program, uh, I had gone back on a tour to uh, Vietnam during uh, uh, March of this year. Uh, I was there for the uh, 50th anniversary of the uh, Tet Offensive and uh, the My Lai Massacre. But we were also, uh, this was a tour of 40 uh, <clears throat> people on this trip, uh, I mean, 40, uh, uh, and we had, um, we had people that were uh, both Vietnam veterans uh, with Veterans for Peace. Some were just veterans who wanted to be on this mission. They were going back for healing. We also had uh, a number of people from the anti-war movement uh, that were active and still active. They worked with the uh, um, coffee houses, the GI coffee houses. We also had GI resistors. So we had Keith Mather, uh, who was of the, tw <clears throat> the Presidio 27, escaped from the Presidio and had gone to um, uh, Canada. Uh, we had uh, Mike Wong, who had done the same thing. He'd been at uh, one of the GI coffee houses, heard what was coming, the, the veterans who were coming back and learning about what was going on in Vietnam and decided to, uh, uh, he could not be a part of that kind of system, went to Canada. Uh, we also had other people who were GI resistors that came. Uh, two of them came from a uh, um, uh, European country, I can't remember if it was Sweden or Denmark, uh, but they, uh, uh, they had actually were in country in 1965, 67, uh, and they decided they could not be a part of the system. They saw what was going on and they fled the country and went to Europe. Uh, but they came back for this event because Ron Carver, who uh, kind of put together a whole uh, exhibit at the War Remnants B Museum, brought the GI resistors together, their stories. We had Susan Snall, who is a member of Veterans for Peace and the ch uh, president of the New York chapter. She was also there and uh, she had brought her daughter. Uh, we had we were there for on March 16th was uh, the exact date for the uh, commemorations of the My Lai massacre. Uh, Mike Hasey uh, was there. You saw that mural that was up there in the very beginning when we were starting the program. Uh, Mike was there the year before, and uh, he saw that that mural was in disarray and needed repairs and and be refinished in some way. Uh, and he thought it would be a good idea if we raised money to do that. And he can talk to you a little bit about that. But the main thing is he comes to the convention, puts up a sign with for too long. He had raised about $8,000, got that to the VMDs. We were there, and it's just a, an incredible mural. Uh, they did a great job. And this was a, 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 while we were there, there was a new pagoda that was kind of set up as a memorial for the uh, the the people that were massacred, literally slaughtered in My Lai. And uh, uh, it was an incredible time to be there. For me, it was a little bit of too much pomp and circumstance at the, the ceremonies, but we were there the day before. And while I was there the day before, uh, looking at the mural and walking on this path that had uh, in cement the, the path that was there of children's feet and, and, and the villagers' feet that were sort of running from it. I can almost hear that in my ears of people screaming and running from gunfire. And, uh, and it just, this, this, all of a sudden this music came from uh, where they were sort of practicing uh, for the, the commemorations the next day, this Vietnamese sorrowful song. And it just kind of blew me away, uh, very powerful. But there were many other things that happened. I kind of want to, uh, as we're talking here, you know, Mike, I want to say that Mike and I uh, <clears throat> both belong to the uh, local chapter, Chapter 72 here. Um, Mike is a, a photographer, as you will see many of his works here, uh, and a poet. Uh, he usually writes those in his captions uh, and his poetry, in his photos. And while in the uh, <clears throat> American War in Vietnam, he was the chief medic in, in a unit for An Khan? An K. An where he served uh, from March 1969 to 1972. Uh, he wrote, and I just put this out here, my father was a career officer, a World War II combat veteran, spent uh, my early youth on military bases in the United States to include Japan and Germany. 
I was absolutely in love with my country until I came back from Vietnam as an Army medic. The core belief system that I was raised with came back in a body bag. That's very powerful, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, myself, I was a Vietnam veteran. Uh, served on, I'm serving on the board of the National <clears throat> Board of Veterans for Peace. And uh, I was in Vietnam in 1968. After the My Lai Massacre, of course, I was came in in August. So, but it was still 50 years since I had put my feet on, on uh, Vietnam. Uh, so it was great to, to go back there, part of a healing process. And I can't believe that um, after what we did, killing some four to six million people Vietnamese, spraying. Agent Orange, and if effects that, that were exposed over another four million people, that these people even could talk to us without anger. But the forgiveness that they have for people knowing that it was not the soldiers themselves, but it was our government and leaders that sent young people to war. And war on either side is horrible. People commit horrendous crimes. So I just want, you know, for me sometimes that's very hard to talk about. But I wanted to go to some of the pictures that we had up there, Jim, uh, and I can talk a little bit about those. If you put, put up uh, some while I was there, these are my pictures. Uh, as I am an Agent Orange victim, um, at the, you got those up? Uh, yeah, so I went to, we went at the, um, um, the War Remnants Museum, and I went upstairs to where they have uh, sort of the exhibit on Agent Orange. And one of the things that I, I, uh, I ran across was this one room where they had all these things with the children. I had been working on an idea for maybe doing, because I'm an artist, I wanted to do some artwork uh, that would kind of deal with the issues of Agent Orange. And then I went in this room and I says, who could do it better than the children themselves? And this is their artwork. These children themselves uh, produced this. This particular one was uh, uh, a young Nymnese uh, age 14 with crayon. Isn't that incredible? Uh, go to the next one. Oh, now you're, you're talking about, they, he calls this my dream. This is age 13. Uh, you know, we, we also left uh, uh, tons of uh, unexploded ordinances and, uh, and oftentimes, you know, these, these little bomblets are, are buried in the ground and kids see it and they think it's, you know, a toy that they can play with. And what you find out is, you know, they, these things explode, they uh, cripple children, kill people. Uh, what they've done in, in Project Renew, uh, our chapter uh, in Vietnam, Chuck Searcy is a, the president of that chapter, but he also is the international advisor to uh, uh, Project Renew, in which they do go around and, and start finding these things to clean them up and explode them. So they have a special training program for children. So when they can recognize what these, these bomblets are, and they would call or go to somebody to, to uh, let uh, Project Renew know, and then they would go out there uh, and find that and explode it. So uh, it saves so many lives, and it's an important project that Veterans for Peace is a part of supporting. There are although there are other nation. Uh, um, uh, I think the Irish and uh, uh, some other countries are also uh, part of uh, supporting Project Renew. So it's a great uh, world uh, effort to try and clean up these uh, these explosives. I'm going to go to the next one. Okay, and you can see here. Again, this one here is um, <clears throat> by some, age 15. Many of the children with, uh, exposed to the, their parents exposed to Agent Orange having children um, with, born without limbs. Uh, you will see other things that happened. My son was born with congenital heart disease, cleft palate, and other abnormalities that eventually he had to go for surgery for his heart when he was three years old in 1981 and died. But I met uh, uh, these children, and you'll see them, some without legs, some without arms, some without fingers. 
some uh, uh, mentally incapacitated, some that are just a piece of meat on a, a that have been taken care of. I see one person who uh, was in a family home, just laying there, unable to do some, now 20 some years old. But they've been taking care of them all these years and VFP, the local community, and other people build a home for the people to take care of that child and now a young person. And you, you know, it's, it's these parents are aging, they worry about who's gonna take care of those kids in the future. We as the United States of America that was a part of that uh, need to own up to that and recognize that we ha owe some responsibility in funding and taking care of these people. You want to go to the next one, please? Uh, here's another one. I just thought that that pic picture actually showed these children writing books. Uh, there are a number of kids that are writers. This is called War's Consequence um, by a 13-year-old. Go to the next. Again, no arms. You'll see a number of children that are doing things with just their feet, painting. Um, this particular one I'm trying to see is a 12-year-old. This is in crayon, believe it or not. They almost seem like paintings to me, you know. Uh, next one. Uh, this is called Agent Orange Victims Rise Above the Difficulties. And that's so true. Uh, when we visit uh, um, Friendship Village in, in, in Hanoi, uh, they have uh, computer classes, they've got various classes that try to uh, uh, place these children in, in jobs that they can do. Some learn music, some go to college. What was uh, the young woman on that we brought here before? Mm -hmm. She's uh, she just finished her college and uh, I forget what she's doing. She's a social worker. She's working at that, that large hospital there in Saigon yeah. with Asian Orange victims. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. She is incredible. Yeah. And we've had her on this program when she mm -hmm. was uh, here before. And Mike's done a number of photographs with her. Uh, the next, um, I think we'll, we'll skip that for now. Uh, let's, let's go on. Uh, can you go to the next pictures? I keep going. This gives people an idea. Keep going. Oh, now this is uh, uh, an, this is down in uh, <coughs> Ho Chi Minh City. This is a visit and when I was visiting Tudoc Hospital, um, Peace Village for Agent Orange uh, children. This is what I mean by some of these children. Um, the, the the birth defects are, are can be very horrendous. Um, you can go to the next. Uh, here's another. This is uh, one of the people on a tour who we're looking at a child who's double nose there. <clears throat> so you can go to the next. I just want you to see this child here. I mean, it looks like uh, 50 years old and just, uh, you know, about four or five uh, and uh, wanted so much attention. These children love it when people come to visit. I was holding this child in my arms. Uh, <clears throat> And I just could feel the love and, and the need for love. And the people, uh, the nurses and the doctors, and sometimes students from the universities come there and spend time with these children to give them some quality of life. And I think uh, that is important. VFP, again, uh, supporting these hospitals. You can go to the next. This is uh, J.J. Johnson with one of the children. Uh, J.J. is one of those... Uh, 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 GI resistors who refused to go and spent time in prison because he refused to go. Oftentimes, the um, white uh, white soldiers uh, uh, would get off uh, and out, but black soldiers were usually sent to prison a lot longer <laughs> period of time. They really came down hard on them. Um, but he is an incredible man and is in the New York chapter of Veterans for Peace. You can go on to the next. Um, sorry, this is. Uh, uh, another person on the uh, on the trip with us, and um, is holding another child. This is you can go on. Ah, now we come to Milai, and remember this woman's name again, Michael. Her name is uh, Q Fan. Q Fan, and she was uh, sort of the uh, guide there that at at the museum there at at uh, uh, Sun Mai Village. Uh, where the My Lai massacre took place. 
And she's, those are all the names up on the wall behind her. And she's explaining, there's pictures of a number of people that were the soldiers that committed the crime and uh, 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 the heroes of, of that, uh, so the soldiers that were um, Hugh Thompson and um, his crew are uh, pictured there. So, and she tells the story. And, and that's your daughter over there on the right hand yes, side. Yes, she's got the phone, she's um, doing a recording. Uh, what's her name again? Her name is Renette. Renette. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was great to meet her. I, yeah, that, yeah, was, yeah. that was, it was good. quite a trip for her. You can go to the next. Ah, uh, now we got Michael. There you can see he was there. Yes, <laughs> I am. And uh, again, do you remember that this was a professor? I had met him. I think I have his card somewhere. Yeah, but a remarkable man. Yeah. I really enjoyed talking to him. Yeah, he was great. Uh, and you can go to the next. Okay, here's a great one, Mike and Renette and Susan Snow, who was also a GI resistor, uh, was an officer uh, who had planned uh, the dropping of leaflets over the uh, Presidio area uh, and ships uh, throughout San Francisco. And uh, because she wore her uniform to a uh, um, uh, protest, she was uh, 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 court-martialed. Uh, but just basically had to resign her position. Uh, this is her daughter, Nina, who came with her. And so to have the, both of these wonderful people <laughs> there with their daughters, I think mm -hmm. was great. I wish I could have had mine there. <laughs> so you can go to the next. And this, again, is the Milan Massacre, I mean, uh, mural, which is a mosaic. And uh, then I think we can go to Mike's photos here. And Mike, you, know, you can talk about this. I actually took this picture in uh, 2016. Um, it was when I went back uh, in 2016 and saw the mural that was there that I realized that there <coughs> had been some significant changes in the, in the mural from when I first saw it in 1994. The mural was finished in 1988. And basically, and, and we'll get to another picture, and so um, it was there that I that I met Q Fan and and um, and asked her how much it would cost to to repair the mural and she uh, she sent me an email when I came back from that 2016 uh, trip and she said it cost forty two hundred dollars to repair it um, and so I went about you know raising eighty six hundred dollars um, through Veterans for Peace because my main concern was to repair the mural for the 2018 50th anniversary. So I had about two years to, to, you know, to get the money together for them to work on it. And, and, and luckily it was finished when it was there and I felt they did an outstanding job oh, on it. They did, now, the, this is a woman by the name of Becky uh, Looning and she, um, she went on the trip uh, with me in 2016 along with her uh, husband, Brian Wilson. She's holding a picture of a helicopter that was in my unit when I was in Vietnam in Anke in 1970. And uh, th the next picture will be a closer shot of her, but on the front of the, of the helicopter, as you see there, the crew had uh, painted in large white uh, letters uh, simply why, as in why are we in Vietnam. And so um, I wanted to, you know, the, I think one of the reasons I like this particular photograph is the f fact that, as far as I'm concerned, um, uh, Becky's face says everything. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a, I was really fortunate to have gotten the expression that I wanted when I took this photograph. So, you go to the next photo. This is actually um, Nicaragua. This is Nicaragua. We can we can come back. Wait, you want to talk about that? Or you want to kind of go back and forth, or? Well, we can do the best we can. Um, I, um, let's see if they're going to... Uh, if you can go beyond that one, uh, Jim, go beyond it. Let's see if we got another one here. We can go back to okay. that. Okay, these are, these are Nicaragua. Okay. okay. Uh, the only thing we can do is I can go back and bounce back and forth. Okay, let's okay. go back and forth. Okay, so I was in, uh, I was in Vietnam, uh, you know, in, uh, in, the month of, uh, in, in the month of March for the 50th anniversary. And then uh, when I came back from that trip, um, a friend of mine by the name of Brian Wilson, who I mentioned before, which is Becky Looning's uh, 
uh, husband, he, uh, he's, uh, he moved to Nicaragua, and so he now lives there. And so he, um, he, uh, he went to see a, a doctor last December because he had severe back pain. You know, a lot of you, uh, some people may not know who Brian is. Brian uh, spent, uh, was in Vietnam. Uh, he was an officer in Vietnam, and uh, he experienced atrocities in Vietnam when he went into four villages after they were napalmed by U.S. jets to ascertain the, whether the uh, pilots were hitting their targets. He and was so, counting bodies. Yeah, so yeah. he went into four villages, and they were all innocent <clears throat> civilians. Yeah. And uh, he had an epiphany in, in Vietnam when he walked into the first village. And he looked down and he saw a dead Vietnamese woman, probably in her early 30s. She had two dead children in one arm and another uh, dead child in the other. And her eyelids were burned off from the napalm. So Brian made eye contact with her. And then he said in his mind, and Brian told me this you know, years ago, yeah. he said, in that moment, and it only took a second, I got it. He realized that he was the enemy in Vietnam. So that was the... Brian says that that's probably the most powerful epiphany experience he ever had in his life. Mm -hmm. So we can go to the next one. Good. Another photo. Okay, um, now we're, this back is back to Vietnam. This is, this is Q Fan, and um, she lost uh, five relatives at the My Lai Massacre on her mother's side. She has worked at the, uh, the My Lai Massacre site for 18 years, and she was a guide. And so... Um, I initially met her, like I said before, in 2016, and I became real close friends with her. And then as a result of, you know, of raising the money, the $8,600 to repair the mural, I was treated really um, as just an honored guest when I, right. when I was there for the 50th anniversary. And of course, I had to constantly tell people that, you know, it was through the, um, the incredible donations that were raised, uh, that were given by Veterans for Peace members that made it all happen. And so I just want to make sure I, I mention that. This, when she was uh, uh, giving us the tour, um, right behind her is the, ditch. the infamous ditch that was, um, that was there where uh, Lieutenant William Calley and some of his men uh, machine gunned and threw hand grenades and they murdered 170 civilians. And uh, so she's giving a talk and, and she's right near the, the mosaic tile mural and then right behind her, of course, is the ditch. Now, a, a lot, the, the, the scene of the ditch has changed a little bit. When I saw it in 1994, it was, uh, I have a picture of it, in fact, uh, ditch, you right know, there. on another, a full, another panel that I can show. But uh, it's, it just shows it just the way it looked in, uh, you know, in 1968. And so anyway, she was talking about what had happened and then she started to break down. Yeah, she started I, crying. I, I can't and, see uh, why. I, well, yeah. I cried when I was there. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, she's a marvelous woman. I cannot tell you uh, how much I, um, I appreciate her friendship. And then as a result of uh, meeting her, then she opened some doors for me. Yeah. So I was able to interview other My Lai survivors when I was there this last March. You should also say, you know, in that ditch, um, uh, after they had basically a machine gun and shot uh, people in the ditch, uh, uh, they sat down and had lunch. Right. And uh, there was a baby that was being protected by one of the the mothers that had been killed and the baby crawled out of there, blood on it, and, and uh, uh, was crawling out of, the, out of the ditch and started to run away. And Callie used to tell somebody, uh, Milo, uh, Milo mm -hmm. uh, to kill, uh, shoot that baby, and, and he wouldn't do it. And he ran after and shot that baby. Right. So, yeah, I mean, when people say, I often hear people say, well, you know, Callie was just a scapegoat. He wasn't just a scapegoat. Right. He was a racist murder right, right. and uh, no question about it yeah. so we can go to the next picture uh, this oh. is a picture of ron haberly ron haberly was the uh, was the combat yeah. photographer that went in with the helicopters that morning uh, into the milai area and he's the one that took all of the infamous photographs right. that appeared in the december 5th 1969 issue of Life magazine and so I met him when I was there he's giving an interview you can tell the uh, the marble wall behind him 
has the names of uh, 504 people who were murdered. And uh, I found um, um, Ron very interesting. I, I asked him two questions. One, I asked him if he had ever taken, did he take any photographs of soldiers actually killing civilians where they were identifiable? And he said, yes, he did. But he said he destroyed both slides because he, he went in there with two cameras. He had, a, he had a Leica camera that was issued by the military. It had black and white film in it. He shot 39 photographs in black and white. And then he had his own personal Nikon camera, which uh, had color slide uh, film in it. And he took, I believe, 17 or 18 photographs. Mm -hmm. The only thing is, is that when they went back to the base after the operation, he did not uh, give the film that he shot in his personal camera. So the military did not know he had taken those 18 photographs. Mm -hmm. And all of those pictures are, all, in fact, most all of them were the ones that were printed in Life magazine. And, and you uh, have that magazine here. Yes, I, you know, I don't know if anybody's, this is what, uh, I'll put it up on the, on the easel here. This is uh, the issue right here. If you want to photograph it, I mean, look at it. That was but, December 5th, 1969. Right, and it, um, and it just shows a picture of a, an African antelope. And then um, I, and as, you, as you thumb through it, you gotta remember that it was, it was you know, these kind of photographs would have never been, uh, would, had never been uh, printed during the, let's say, the Iraq War. So here's one of the, probably the one of the most, I want to call famous. it famous or infamous pictures. Infamous, man. Yeah. And this is, this picture was, you know, was shown, um, was on display at the Meline Museum. Shows, a, you know, a, a large path with probably about 20 or 25 uh, bodies in the, in the road there. And so uh, I believe that uh, Haverly took this photograph from a helicopter. So... Anyway, so if we can go to the, to the next slide. Um. I should say, too, that Haberly also was, uh, his photos, people, people were starting to write about this, but nobody was believing it. Even with the black and white photographs, it's when the color photographs came out that was too real for them right. to, to right. deny. Yeah. yeah, when they saw the blood. Uh, and the other, um, the, the reason why... Um, he said he destroyed two of the color slides, and I asked him why he did that. And he was concerned that if he, that if he later gave those images to the military, that the military would blame the people that were recognizable in the photograph, and he did not want to do it, because he looked at me and he said they were all killing civilians. That's right. And the other thing I asked him was, are you going to write a memoir of what happened? And basically he said, well, I don't think that I could probably say anything more that hasn't already been said. But there's two sides of the coin here, Dan, as you well know. There's the pictures and the graphic photographs that he took showing the massacre, but the other part, the flip side of the coin, is how did it affect him personally? Right. How has the My Lai massacre affected him decade after decade after decade? And I think that's the story he needs to write about. Right. So why don't we go to, the, and this is a picture which we just saw, of course, in the, uh, in the Life magazine issue, and this is, um, this is Q Fan, you know, you know just basically, basically giving um, a talk about that particular photograph when we were on her tour, uh, that when we were inside the actual museum itself. Was Haberly there in that tour right uh, there? Yeah, he was there. Uh, but he was not on the tour. Okay. I was trying to do th two things simultaneously. I was trying to follow her and take photographs, and then Haverly was in the museum giving an interview, and I was back oh, and forth that's trying. Right. To, I, saw that. I was trying. I was yeah. back and forth trying to get, um, you know, pictures of both people because I knew I could not let the uh, let my opportunity to photograph Ron Haverly pass by. So. Right. I was really fortunate to have met him, yeah. and so I wish I could have spent more time with him. And so I'm glad you did because I wouldn't have recognized him. I didn't right. know him. I was there, but I didn't know yeah. who he was. You know. Yeah. So that was so, great that you were. Yeah, I was. I was really grateful, and I hope that someday that I can uh, meet him again because there's some more. Uh, there's some more questions I want to ask him. Yeah. That's so great. we can go to the next uh, picture. This is my daughter, Renette. She uh, was born when I was in Vietnam. She was born December 31st, 1970. And, uh, of course, she's now 47. 
She's from, um, she's from um, Tampa, Florida, and she flew out to Portland and then went with me on the trip. So she's, you know, for years and years, she's heard me, you know, talk about Vietnam, my experiences. And then, of course, uh, when I went back this time, that was my third trip back. So several months ago, she asked me if she could go with me, and I was really surprised that she wanted to go. But I was really grateful that she did. So this is a picture of her standing in front of the, the marble wall that's got the 504 names on it. Right. So we can go to the next, next. one. <coughs> This is a woman that is one of the survivors of the My Lai Massacre. Okay, um, after, the, uh, after the ceremony was over um, and, uh, and Q uh, finished her tour of not only inside the museum but the grounds itself, she uh, then took me to uh, an area that really wasn't that far, a small village that was right near uh, where we were, mm -hmm. uh, and so she said there were there, there were several people that lived there that were, uh, were survivors of the massacre. Mm -hmm. So this woman, and I'm a little, probably have a little difficulty um, um, maybe with the names, but her name is uh, Lee Lee Thai Chi, and she's 87 years old. Uh, in this picture, she is pointing toward the sky as she remembered hearing artillery rounds landing in the outlying area of the village. Shortly after the helicopters landed carrying American soldiers, she and her two young children hid in an underground tunnel near her house. The opening was covered with brush, so the soldiers were not, a were not aware that they were there. When she and her children came out several hours later, there were dead bodies everywhere. And she was, you know, basically telling me that story. It gives me a chill. Yeah. So let's go to the, the next, next one. picture. What a great effort. It's also, if people should realize that, you know, when we say My Lai Massacre, uh, Sun Mai is one village. There were like uh, four different My Lai uh, uh, villages. They called the whole area Pinkville, uh, where all the communists were, you know, is what mm -hmm. they thought. But uh, there were a number of different villages uh, and different companies that went into them. They massacred all in all of those villages, and that's what you have to realize. This is a woman that, on her way over to uh, the house of, a, of another woman that we interviewed, um, this woman drove up on a motorcycle. And, uh, and you know, uh, Q started talking to her. And this woman is, uh, is 65 years old. She was 15 when the massacre happened. And she, when the, when, the, when the helicopters landed, what she did is she went and hid in the tall grass. Mm. And then she stayed there for a couple hours. And then uh, when she felt it was safe to come out, she then was exposed to just dead bodies everywhere. And so a uh, remarkable woman. I, uh, and she just happened to come by on a motorcycle when we were on our way to over to another house to, uh, to interview uh, you know, another survivor. Right. So why don't we go to the... Next photograph. This is a picture of, um, of a woman by the name of Ha Thi Kwe. She's, uh, she's 93 years old. Her mother and daughter were murdered at My Lai by the American soldiers. She was also herded into uh, the drainage ditch and only survived because she was under uh, several bodies. Uh, in the picture, she is holding her, uh, actually it's another picture where she's holding her leg where, uh, and, I, and that image will come up in a minute, but she's holding her leg there and that's, is, yeah. yes, that's where she got shot in the leg. And so um, anyway, um, when, uh, what happened is that uh, she laid uh, perfectly still after they, after they um, mowed down the, 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 the people in the ditch and they thought everyone was dead. And so she was under several bodies and the, the blood started you know, filling up the ditch and it started to come up to her nostrils. And what she did is she turned her head ever so slightly so she could breathe. And so anyway, a remarkable woman. Um, I'm hoping that I can interview her again when I go back to My Lai next year. And then the one, the one that we saw before was uh, more of a portrait shot that I took of her because after we interviewed her, we left the house and then I turned around and she was sitting on a stool right at the front door. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, there was something about her look 
that was different than when I was interviewing her in the house. So I went back and I got this photograph and I'm really glad I decided to do a black and white of this one. But I really think it shows the strong character in her face. Mm -hmm. so, Anyway, so, so I'm it so looks glad like she's looking into the past. Yeah, so, I'm so know. glad that I went back and got this uh, this photograph. So you move and, on with the next. Yeah, this is uh, Ron Haverly. Um, I I think uh, uh, previously when we put when I put up those two we put up those two photographs. Uh, that's uh, that's Becky. Uh, in the photograph to the left, she's standing in front of that that's that really large uh, monument there. And then the, the picture to the right is a close-up of her, which we also uh, displayed Sorry. earlier. And that's Ron Haverly holding up those two billfold-sized photographs because I asked him if he would hold them up while I took a photograph. I just wanted to, his face on the photograph. So anyway, we can go to the next one. This is the, the, um, the mosaic tile mural that we repaired. And uh, a lot, they've done a lot of uh, 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 reconstruction on this. Uh, when I saw it in, um, you know, in 2016, it didn't have the roof that it's got on it. You know, they repaired the back of the, of the, you know, of the mural, which was really kind of falling apart. And they went in and repaired a lot of the tile that had been chipped away. And I just happened to take this photograph when that Vietnamese man was there. And what he's looking at is he's looking at the ditch. Mm -hmm. That's how close the ditch it is, is yeah. to the, 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 the mosaic tile mural. That's right. Okay, you go to the next picture. And this is the scene uh, the, the, on the 16th as I walked, walked into, into the, you know, to all the ceremony. It hadn't quite started yet. But you there's can a museum right on the right. Right, the museum yeah. is off to the, to the right. And then you can see the, you know, the large statue that's in the, in the background. So I just wanted to kind of give a, um, just kind of an opening shot of, of kind of people milling around and kind of give I, a scale to it. Too. Right, exactly. So anyway, we can go to the next one if you want to. This is a man by the name of Fan Thai Kong. He's 61 years old, and um, he was the um, the. He was the director of the My Lai Massacre Museum for uh, 27 years. Yeah. He was 11 years old when the American soldiers came in that morning. And uh, what happened is he was in a, in a small hut with, uh, with uh, his mother and three siblings. His father was working out in the fields. So he wasn't there. And so what happened is they, 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 uh, they had them come outside the hut. And then a few minutes later, they told him to go back inside the hut, and then shortly after they did that, an American soldier threw a hand grenade in there and killed everyone except him. And the only reason he wasn't killed is he was in the back of the hut, and the bodies of his siblings and his mother protected him from being killed. He was wounded in about three places. So anyway, a remarkable man. And I, I, you know, I, I really, really enjoyed talking to him. And I, of course, I always did it through an interpreter. So we can go to the next slide. And this is a woman oh, that probably, um, if you were to YouTube. I've got her picture myself, too. Yeah, if you were to YouTube um, uh, survivors of the My Lai Massacre, she would be one that you would see. And she's talking about you know, what happened. And she's very emotional, very articulate. And so anyway, uh, her name is Fan Thi Th Th Thuan. She's 80 years old. Her uh, father, sister, and brother, and three nephews were murdered at the My Lai Massacre. And uh, she and her six-year-old daughter were herded into the ditch and only survived because they were under other bodies. Mm -hmm. And again, they stayed absolutely still until the American soldiers left. Um, she, like I say, she's been a critical eyewitness to the slaughter and her emotional testimony in the past is shockingly real and concise. She says here, at night after the massacre, when she heard cats meowing, she could hear babies crying and dying in the ditch. So, marvelous there's, woman. There's a sculpture there that I swear to God, she is the model. Yes, for that I think sculpture. you're right. I, I, I know, I know the one you're talking about. Sculpture that's just yes. kind of out there. Exactly. It's oh, a very, very powerful, powerful piece of work. Yes. Yeah. An, an amazing woman. I want to go back and I want to, I want to do an, uh, actually I didn't have a chance to interview her, 
Uh, but I took her photograph and I want to go back next year and I yeah. want to spend some time with her. She was walking around with the sort of the children's exhibit there. Right. And, there, and, and I asked her, can, can I take your picture? She said yes. Oh. And I got a great picture. But I, I didn't have time to sit there and I talk. Know. I wanted I, to I know. spend I, more time, I think. Yeah. You know, but if, if, you, if, if people were to the Google uh, or uh, get on YouTube and, and, and just put her name there, um, you know, she'll come up and she gives a very emotional testimony wow. and just an amazing testimony. So nice. anyway, we can go to the next picture. This is a photograph that I took of a woman that was right there, you know, that uh, Buddhist temple that was, oh, yeah. that was dedicated. You know, at uh, when we were uh, that we were uh, when when we right. were there, yeah. um, they started building it about a year ago, and it was uh, it was uh, it was done, uh, and it was an idea that that Mr. Kong had, and so anyway, it, this was taken. She's right outside the building, and they're having the ceremony inside, and something told me that this woman was significant. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. Was her expression or body language or whatever? Anyway, I sent this photograph uh, back to Vietnam and I emailed it to Q Fan and she told me that her name is Din Thai Thanh, T-H-A-N, she's 86 years old, and her parents and two cousins were murdered at My Lai, and at the time of the massacre she was living with her husband in another village, and that's the reason wow. why she wasn't killed. But uh, I, the, uh, the expression on her face was just incredible. So Great we job. can go to the next one. This is back in, um, in Nicaragua. Uh, this, of course, you know, I, I, I arrived in Nicaragua on, um, on March, I'm sorry, on May the 4th, and I was there until May the 27th. And so, I, like I say, my friend uh, Brian uh, Wilson, uh, who lives there now, uh, he was hospitalized and had back surgery. Uh, they thought the back surgery would only be three or four hours. As it turned out, it was nine straight hours. And they had to go in and put titanium pins and screws in. And so uh, it was a very, very lengthy operation. And so I spent a lot of time driving <coughs> excuse me, the water here. From, um, from a town called Granada which is located about 30 miles south of Managua. And so when I'd make the trip up uh, with a, a Nicaraguan driver, we were coming, uh, we were having to face a lot of the blockades along the, uh, along the highways we drove up and also going back at night after I visited Brian. Well, you might, you might, <coughs> you might say why. Uh, I mean, people may have been seeing this in the media and where they're talking about the uh, student uprising right. and rising, all these things that are happening in Nicaragua right now. And it just so happened while you were there. Right. And uh, for me, I mean, I would have thought, I'm back in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah I, um, I, they, I was, um, like I say, I got there on, um, on May the 4th. And by that time, about a little over 50 people had been killed. Mm. And they, what they were trying to do, a lot of the demonstrators were trying to do, is they were trying to slow commerce down. So they were blocking. They were having setting up blockades to try to stop the the uh, the trucks and the buses that were that were going to Managua, and so there was many many checkpoints, and uh, and then uh, there were barricades. There were a lot of uh, tires on fire, and there was people that were manning the checkpoints, and a lot of them had bandanas on because uh -huh. they didn't want to be photographed. And the driver that I was with warned me, he says, don't take close-up shots of people with their, that, are, uh, that are wearing the bandanas because they don't want to be recognized. Right. So I was really careful. So anyway. We go to the next photo. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting, Dan, when, uh, when I would watch the television uh, news and, and, and they, would, they would show extensive coverage about what was going on, you know, during the... Uh, during the during the events that were taking place and and you know in Managua and and and, uh, and especially Masaya, which was a, a, a one of the, it's a third largest uh, city in uh, in Nicaragua, which is about probably around I would say probably 35 miles south of Managua, and they would have all of these images on. They showed pictures of dead people in the street, 
They, as you notice here, this is a picture of a, of a it looks like a teenage boy that's all bloody in the face. And I'm not sure if he's dead or not, but it was interesting. They, sh they showed a lot of images that you would never see on American television. They interviewed people at the scene. You saw people in grief. And um, so well, I, I was, I, I was really you know, surprised. I, I wonder sometimes because, that, um, I mean, we do see when, when the U.S. wants to show, um, if they want regime change in a place and they want to show the violence, right, like right. they showed the kids in Syria being gassed or something right, like right. that. So yeah. then they show. But if they are responsible, they won't show. Right, exactly. And so we kind of get the, this sort of propaganda. It's interesting because when, uh, when this broke out, I'm paying close attention. We're talking about the Sandinista Revolution. Right. The U.S. has been trying to undermine it ever since. Um, you know, there are many things that are happening. Eh, you know, I, I'm not there. I don't know the the corruption. Uh, you hear there's corruption of, of uh, uh, Ortega and his, his spouse uh, there, and people are calling for him out. But the thing that bothers me is they had. I was watching an interview, and they were talking. These students were saying. Uh, we need to stand up. Well, students are the ones who usually are protesting. Right, right. Yet there was another group of students that were, and, they, and the students that were there were actually talking about how um, Ortega was a capitalist. He was, uh, and, well, the U.S., I, I don't understand because the U.S. loves capitalists, yet at the same time uh, uh, they had another group of students that were at the White House talking to exactly. uh, the White House, asking the Trump administration to intervene. Right. You know, now, that wouldn't, now, these students there said they wouldn't want that to happen. Right. And, a, and that makes me say it's very difficult for us to understand who is all the players here because that's a part of sort of a regime change right. concept. So right, we right. have, I, yeah. that's, I think people need to know that. Right. I don't want to just give one point of view. I want right. others. And Camila Mejia, who actually is? Uh, did you get a chance to talk to him? By the way, I, sent you I haven't had a chance to talk to him. Yeah. Of course, I you know I know uh, Camilo, Camilo. And, and I met his father yeah. uh, a couple of years ago, who yeah. lives and you know, was a very famous artist in, in uh, Nicaragua. Yeah, he's a musician. Uh, he's a, yeah. a very very good musician. Yeah. And so anyway, so I got to meet him. And one thing is like just like you said, there was there were the students that went to to, to you know to Washington and, and met you know some of our politic so called political leaders. And like Ted Cruz and right. um, Marcus, Mark uh, uh, Rubio, and uh, anyway, but there were a lot. There were some students, and I'm that, and actually a lot of students back in Nicaragua that did not support them going. I know. To and, and the United States. And they said that too. So, they said, they said that, that so there's that. a different faction of students. Right. Right. So. And so the people need to know that they're different. Right. Right. I mean, to me, it's um, uh, I don't want to see interventions. Uh, ever <laughs> right. by the U.S. because I don't trust uh, what their motives are. Uh, like in Syria or uh, Iraq, uh, uh, Venezuela, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> and Nicaragua, these are, if we just get out and let people solve their own problem, right. they will solve those problems. And that's how uh, we're going to eventually be able to uh, hopefully find peace in that. I agree. Uh, I think uh, you're right that people need to solve their own, countries need to solve their own problems. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's, I don't know, I guess we're all, I don't know, there were some more pictures of Nicaragua. Yeah, there you go. Now this picture here, I'm in a, in a, in a vehicle with a Nicaraguan driver and we're headed um, south of uh, Managua and the smoke that you see in the sky there was a huge plume of smoke and the town where this is coming from was Messiah, which is where some of the worst violence took place. Mm. And the next day I had found out to the uh, paper that three people had been killed and 24 injured. Oh, and so horrible. anyway, we just bypassed the, uh, Messiah. There was no way we were going to go into Messiah. Were you having uh, post-traumatic stress at that Well, point? I mean, I think things were happening so fast. fast. I was a little hypervigilant. But you know, uh, at least the, you know, the, at least uh, most of the roadblocks. In fact, all of the roadblocks that we were at, the weapons that I did see were the mortars, the yeah. mortar, the, the yeah. makeshift uh, um, mortar guns that they yeah. had. You know, yeah. this is a student demonstration just out of Managua, and um, it, you know, it, it really kind of speaks for itself. And uh, so. Uh, anyway, they were slowing us down. We had to move really fat, really slow, going through this area. 
This is a mural of, of, of uh, Daniel Ortega and his wife, Rosario Murillo, and you can see what has happened. Someone has thrown uh, paint on the, on the, uh, on the poster, mm -hmm. on the mural. So let's see the next. This is one of the um, one, of the, one of the uh, barricades that people built, and then what they do is they would the the brick was the road, and what they were doing is they were tearing up the brick from the road, and then they would and then they would build this wall. So we can go to the next, and this is another. Uh, this is kind of a turnaround here, and we're driving through. This is mostly students demonstrating, you know, waving Nicaraguan flags. A very peaceful demonstration. Um, you know, most of them were young, you know, young people. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the uh, same, same time that the, the previous picture was taken. And, um, and this is a, uh, probably a Nicaraguan teenager that was, uh, you know, that was selling Nicaraguan flags to everybody. It was interesting, too, that I, I just saw a email from uh, Camilo who uh, was talking about how you know, some of the students were saying they were a peace movement that right. was standing out. Yet, they had taken a, a, a Sandinista supporter, beat him, burned his body in the street. I did not know that. Yeah. And he says, you call that a peaceful group of people that believe in peace? Wow. Uh, it, it bothered him. I just want to, <clears throat> I want to read something, uh, sort of, that he just, he put a, a letter out to right. uh, Amnesty International. And he kind of explained a number of different things. <clears throat> you know, that uh, happened uh, in Nicaragua, they kind of started it. I mean, they started telling you that, you know, Ortega was playing with the uh, uh, Social Security and all of this stuff, and they got angry about it. But actually, it was the, the, the um, uh, IMF bank that right. called for uh, uh, a reduction in uh, in 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 benefits to to the uh, Social Security, to raise the age, all of these things. And they, th this is being put out all over as though the, the, the uh, um, Ortega had done this, right. when in fact it was the opposite and that the, the uh, businesses in that area, the capitalists uh, okay. actually had called for that kind of stuff. And, but Ortega decided, no, we're going to raise benefits and we're going to uh, keep the age there. We were talking about a lot of the people he said that were um, the Sandinistas uh, uh, rebels uh, at the time that these people were aged and uh, needed uh, uh, Social Security because the country's in right. poverty. So right. a lot, there's still, you know, you have a, a, a trade kind of barrier right. against the country in a lot of ways. And so these, <laughs> the, the, he, you know, you got to try and take care of spread the wealth in some ways. Uh, and he was going to tax the businesses, and that's who called out right. uh, this stuff. So you have to be careful. But he writes, uh, the Nicaraguan government has its deficiencies and the contradictions to work on. Like all governments, and as the Sandinista, Sandinista myself, I would like to see the party transformed in various important ways, both internally uh, and externally. I have refrained from writing on those deficiencies and contradictions, however, because of the violent protests and ensuing chaos we have seen are not a result of the Nicaraguan government's shortcomings, but rather of many of its successes in the inconvenient truth is the reason the United States and the allies, including Amnesty International, have chosen and create highly politicized and polarized environments. Correct. Um, <clears throat> go to extraordinary lengths to manipulate and manufacture evidence for both the internal and external consumption. At the time when the Organization of American States, the United States, the Vatican have called for peaceful constitutional reforms as the only way out of the conflict, Amnesty International has continued to beseech the international community not to abandon the Nicaraguan people. Such, and in other words, continue to support the, uh, the chaos and right. the revolution. Uh, such bias stance uh, obscenely bloated on the highly manipulated, distorted, one-sided information has made the terrible situation in Nicaragua even worse. The loss of Nicaraguan lives, including the blood of those ignored by Amnesty International, has been used to manufacture evidence used by the organization to report, which makes the organization complicit 
in that future foreign intervention might fall upon the Nicaraguan people. It is now up to the organization to correct that wrong and to do what they can to reflect what's really happening. Right. So, you know, we're going to be <clears throat> coming to the end here. I just wanted to add that because I think sure. Camila was uh, uh, a veteran who was a GI resistor right. and, if and, any, and his family was rev right. revolutionaries in, yeah. in that time. And if anybody should know the, the truth, it would be uh, Camilo. He was yeah. born and raised in Nicaragua, he knows the culture, speaks the language. And so, yeah, I respect him a lot. Yeah. Uh, so I want to put that, but I want to say uh, this was an incredible show to talk about both Nicaragua sure, sure. and Vietnam, to share your photos. Yeah, well, thank uh, you. You're an extraordinary photographer. Uh, your captions really capture oh, thank uh, you. the meeting. So I really appreciate you coming here and doing that. Uh, it's uh, always any a last words for the people out there? Well, I, I just want to say it's always, it's always a pleasure to be on your, on your program. I think the main thing that if people want to know what's going on, they've got to do their own research. Yeah. You know, it, it, you've got to be careful with the uh, mainstream uh, uh, newspapers and, and whatever that you've, you've got to get your sources from something other than mainstream news. Yeah, do we trust a government that uh, separates children at the border? Right. You know, what's going on in Central America is not just Nicaragua, but uh, Honduras. They had a coup, right. Right. Uh, and these children are fleeing from an oppressive government, a government uh, that is involved in the cartels and, ch and exploiting people, and they're fleeing that country, coming to the border, calling for asylum. You know, what is so hypocritical, uh, Dan, and I know you know this, that the United States has, has the audacity to call Nicaragua corrupt, Daniel Ortega corrupt. But since the end of World War II, the United States has bombed 30 countries. Thank you. That is true. And, uh, you know, I'm uh, here in Portland. We have a number of people that are involved in uh, uh, resisting ICE, uh, calling for the abolition of ICE. Right. Uh, they shut down the uh, detention center. Uh, uh, a detainment center at uh, um, Amacadam. I want to say thank you to all the people out there and uh, it's going to be a while for our next show but we'll let you know. I want to thank everybody for being here. Mike, thank, thank you brother. Thank you. Always Appreciate good to have you. Thank you very much.